Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Joy Taylor. On today's show, should Tom Brady be looking over his shoulder after Jimmy G's big game on Thursday? Plus the latest with Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys. And are Nick Saban and Jim Harbaugh overrated? We've got a packed show today. Skip, Shannon, let's debate. Happy Friday. Let's get started with the latest on Ezekiel Elliott. Pro Football Talk is reporting that Elliott will definitely be suspended for a domestic abuse accusation from last summer. Then the NFL Network reports the suspension could come as early as today. Our own Chris Carter was here on Monday and said he was hearing a suspension would happen in 24 to 48 hours. All of this came after Jerry Jones said he did not expect Zeke to be suspended last week. Shannon, what do you expect will happen? I expect Ezekiel Elliott to get suspended between two and four games. Now, some people speculate it might be more because in the guidelines with Roger Goodell came, Commissioner Goodell came out with in 2014, the minimum is six games. Could be as many as 10. Mitigating circumstances moves it up or down. So I'm going I'm to go, I'm going to say it's going to be two to four games, Skip. And the thing is, people are like, well, it's taking so long. Well, they've been trying to wrap this up for the longest. But Zeke keeps doing things that says, okay, paper just white out everywhere, Skip, because we, we think we're done here, and guess what? Well, Zeke pulled the ladies' top down. Mm-hmm. Well, Zeke was reportedly in a bar fight and, and another, and then doing this. 100 and miles an hour. 100, yeah, yeah, that also. And, Skip, one thing I know that Commissioner learned from 2014 is that when he rushed the judgment mm-hmm. in the Ray Rice case, okay, it's going to be two games. And then all of a sudden that tape comes out, and now all of a sudden he's like, this can't be two games. It's got to be 16 games. It's got to be the rest of the season. And then Ray Rice goes to court. The judge said, you can't do this. That new tape did not, uh, another act did not happen. All it did was highlight the old act. So mm. he won the case, but anyway, Ray Rice has not played since then. <clears throat> Skip, he can ill afford to have another 2014. He can ill afford to give, let nothing happen and then pictures or something leaks out. Yep. He'll never overcome that, Skip. And I believe this one of my favorite saying is that you measure 10 times and cut once as opposed to cutting 10 times because you measured once. And he's going to be very measured. He's going to be very methodical in this approach. And even if – and 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 it's being reported that it's going to be the domestic violence thing. That's what's going to – you're going to trigger this, this big suspension. Skip, even if that wasn't the case, don't you think pulling a la- young lady's top down in public – isn't that unbecoming? For, for, oh, wait, wait, how do you know she didn't tell him? Skip, I don't care what she told him. That's assault. You can't do that. And he doesn't seem to get it. I don't care what anybody says. It is a no, it's not normal for a father to leave his wife and two daughters in Missouri and move to Columbus, Ohio with the son that's going to enroll in Ohio State to play football. That's not normal. Because no, normal behavior is that you feel you've, as a parent, you feel you've done a good enough job and you've taught your child right from wrong and how to be a young adult that you feel very, very comfortable, Skip, sending them out because this is really going to be the first time they're going to be fully on their own because they're not going to be under your supervision. They're going to get the you Obviously, they got to go to school, Skip, but they're moving away from you. As a young adult, this is your opportunity to say, Mom, Dad, you've done a great job with me. You can have the utmost trust in me, and I'm going to do right by you and this last name, Elliot. Dad said, nah, I need to be there with you, bro, because I'm not sure that you understand what's at stake here, and I'm not sure I can really totally all the way trust you. That's not normal behavior, Skip. I'm sorry. You can say, oh, that's just being a loving father. No, that's a father that does not trust his son. Did your mom move move with you to Nashville? Oh, you know, she stayed in Oklahoma, did she? You're like, no, nah, as a matter of fact. She didn't even know. She was I, ready. She was like, no, oh. No, she didn't know I even went to Nashville. Uh, Go she, ahead. She was like, hey, no. I, I need to get you on out the door. Hey, you need no. some extra money, Skip? She, she was out the door. But <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but, Skip, I, I mean, this is, this is, in all sincerity, this is not a joking manner. And the NFL is going to have to come down because they're going to have to come down because Jerry Jones won't. That's why his players love playing with him so much because he will forgive the worst behavior. The only time Jerry is upset at a player if he can't play on Sunday. Any other time, Jerry's going to vouch for you because we've seen him hire people. Think about it, Skip. You're a professional athlete, and Jerry has to hire a chaperone to get you to and from. That's not normal. That's, you're condoning. You're, you're basically saying, as long as you show up for practice and you play for me, I'm willing to forgive anything else. 
Because you can say, well, that's not what Jerry's saying. That's absolute what he's saying. Because as a professional, as a young man, you shouldn't have to have a chaperone. Mm -hmm. Jerry shouldn't have to have somebody to usher you to and from practice, get you to and from the game, make sure you're in at a reasonable hour. You're a professional athlete. You're a young adult. You should be able to do that on your own. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to be surprised mm -hmm. if Ezekiel Elliott gets anywhere between two and four games because I believe that's what's going to happen. Mm. As a non-Cowboy fan, you are loving this. No, Skip, I, I've Skip, never I, heard you relish talking no, about Skip, something the way you relished piling on the way you just piled Skip, on. Skip, I don't, I don't like bad to happen to no uh, one. Stop. But I foretold of this because when I factored in nine and seven, yeah. don't you think I factored this in? No, you did not. Okay. You just went way out on a limb that was breaking underneath you, and you're saying, please, God, suspend him. Please, God, No, suspend. no, no, Skip. You know I wouldn't wish ill on anybody. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> so... I did choose to wear all black today because I'm oh, already I'm already in mourning because I know it's coming. You know how I feel. My heart has said no, no, no. My head said from the start, yep, yes, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so here it comes. And look, I, I try to rationalize just from a football standpoint. I'm gonna stand by my prediction. Again, we're just let's just do the football first here. I believe that Darren McFadden and Alfred Morris and even little Ronnie Hillman, refugee from the Broncos, mm -hmm. will give them enough of a running back by committee that they can survive for a while without Zeke. Just survive, not flourish, but survive. In fact, I think with this group, they could beat the Giants in the opener at Jerry World. I'm gonna stand by that. But again, I, I'm, I'm going to call back what Chris Carter told us, that his information, which sounds like it was very good information, mm -hmm. even though it didn't happen that quickly, it's very possible that his report might have pushed it back a little bit, even Mike Florio, uh, football, what's it called, football talk, oh. and from NBC, pro football talk, said that his sources were telling him that it got pushed back because Chris reported it. Who knows? But the point is that... Chris is saying that Lisa Friel, who oversees domestic violence now for the commissioner, mm -hmm. is going to be the driving force behind laying out in detail what that investigative arm of the NFL has found out about the domestic violence engaged in by Ezekiel Elliott with the accusing woman. And yet, obviously, as, we, as we've heard, both the police department in Columbus, Ohio, and in Fort Lauderdale investigated and could not find enough credible evidence to charge mm -hmm. in either city. So I'm back to where I was a few days back, which is the shock to me about all this is that Jerry Jones, the owner, obviously, the Hall of Fame now owner of the Dallas Cowboys, has not been noncommittal about this issue from the start. He has been very committal about it. And in all my years of covering and writing books about Jerry Jones, I've never heard him so outspoken about any potentially dangerous issue for the Dallas Cowboys. He has been on the record from the start as saying there is nothing there about the domestic violence. And ESPN the magazine reported that at the league meeting back in, I believe it was October of this past football season, Jerry had a confrontation with one Lisa Friel in which he went nose to nose with her according to the report and was giving the usual, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, and that he concluded in that little confrontation to Lisa Friel, your bread and butter is going to get both of us thrown out in the street. And if I can sort of interpret that Jerryism. He's saying what you do best, which is investigate domestic violence, and she was hired post Ray Rice 2014 to do just that for the commissioner. Correct. That your bread and butter is going to, so to speak, bite the hand that feeds all of us. Right. The National Football League, because you potentially are going to try to take down the young man who took the NFL by storm last year, whose jersey sales, merchandise sales are now up to number two on the list to Tom Brady. And I, this is just a gut feeling on my part. Jerry has been so outspoken about it. So has Steven. So has Jason Witten, a very conservative voice in that locker room. But just a couple days ago, his point was that he's, he's fairly confident Zeke will be playing game one. 
Wow, Jason Witten said that. Well, he's only going to say that if he heard it from the horse's mouth, from the owner, mm -hmm. or maybe from Stephen Jones, the mm -hmm. son. And I just believe that Jerry is going to fight this. If, in fact, that's what happens, and, and we're, I gotta, I'm waiting to see, because if there's domestic violence, then I'm out on Zeke. If, if you can show me chapter and verse, yeah. if you can detail it, if you have pictures, I don't know what you have. But if you can show me and tell me and convince me, then I am out on Ezekiel. And to your point, I thought it was supposed to be six games. I mean, if you bust somebody for for out-and-out out domestic violence, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Doesn't it start at six games? Yes, that's what he said. Six games and mitigating circumstances can move it. it. It starts at six, but mitigating circumstances can move it up or down. So it can be four to two, or it can okay. be ten, or it can be the season. And in my conversations with Chris Carter from the start, going back several weeks ago, he was hearing originally from people inside six to ten. So, so he wouldn't be surprised, I think, if he were sitting here right now, if it went all the way up towards to the, 10. To the 10. Wow. Okay? Because I don't know the severity. All I know is that two police departments investigated mm -hmm. and found not enough credible evidence. Right. And again, it always, not always, but in this case, it does seem to come down to she said and he said. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And if you believe the she said and you can back it up, then again, I'm out. I'm, I'm with you. It, it should be whatever the, the maximum should be. But Chris Carter also said there was something that he was electronically he was supposed to turn over, and somehow it oh, yeah, ended up had, being destroyed okay. or not being able to. So now be, we're back to deflate game. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay. So I pointed out the other day, Jerry was the first owner and the only owner to go renegade on the National Football League and challenge revenue sharing in court, right. along with Phil Knight and Nike, mm -hmm. naming rights. I'm going to challenge you on this. I, I want to. I want 100% of what I'm earning over here because we're earning a whole lot more as America's team than all these other teams are combined. Correct. So I challenge you. I sue you. I take you to court. Jerry won. Yes. Not completely, but he won enough that he got to keep a lot of the revenue sharing right. and the naming rights. I don't blame Jerry. Skip, the way I look at it is like this here. Okay, whatever we get as a, as a corporation, NFL, TV contracts, uh, Nike, all the, all the uh, uniforms, all that stuff, Verizon or whomever else, the tap Microsoft, okay. But if I just do a deal exclusively, I got Coca-Cola. You think I'm about to share that with 31 other teams okay. when I went negotiate? All right, fine. You must be crazy. Okay, but it, the law was the NFL yeah. law. Yeah, it was. And everybody fell in line, and even Mr. Kraft always says, I'm a league man. Jerry wasn't a league man. No. That's why I'm a little surprised he got in the Hall of Fame. But, but he challenged it, and he won. That was in 95. But the writers love it. <laughs> well, they love him because he's a quote machine. Exactly. He makes your job but real easy, Skip. He, he can. But I always say this about Jerry. He's prone to saying dumb things, but he ain't stupid. No. So, especially when it comes to league matters and business matters and court matters, Jerry ain't stupid. So, I, when I try to do two plus two equals four, my two, Jerry being this outspoken about there's nothing there, plus two that he challenged the league and won equals four, he just might do it again. Mm -hmm. What if he takes this to court? What if he says our legal system found nothing twice on this young man? How, Lisa Friel, did you and your investigators find this? I don't know. And again, I'm not trying to overly defend Ezekiel because just remember my stance on Greg Hardy. After I read that woman's testimony, and again... Heard the 911 call? All of it. It, it. it was so damning. It was so disgusting, so egregious that I said, as a Cowboy fan, please don't sign Greg Hardy. Don't bring him in here. And Jerry brought him in. Right. And you know the rest of the story. It blew up right. in Jerry's face because he was a nightmare from the start. Yep. And certainly not repentant in any way, shape, or form and continued to, to express that kind of behavior. Yeah. But Skip, here's the thing. If you start if you start to look for something, you go in someone's house and you say, don't go in there, don't go in there, don't look there. What are you going to do, Skip? When Jerry Jones tells Lisa Friel, Le mm -hmm. Lisa Friel, excuse me, mm -hmm. stop looking, there's nothing there, yeah. what do you think she's going to do? She's going to look and dig a little deeper. So here's the thing, Skip. Okay, if I just tell you on his face, I'm not going to say any name. There was an alleged assault took place in Ohio. There's an another alleged assault that took place in Florida. 
There was a young man that pulled a lady's top down at a St. Patrick's Day parade. There is a, uh, another. There are two more incidents where, a sus where someone from the Cowboys was allegedly involved in a bar fight. Now, if it's three, four different guys, you're like, well, okay. Well. But how does the same guy this keeps happening to? That's not a coincidence. The old saying is, Skip, you got to practice real hard to get all these coincidences. This is not a coincidence, no, Skip. No, I, I agree. But I think the severity of the suspension is going to only deal with domestic, domestic. violence, right. domestic assault. Right. That I think, because that's the, the, the rest of it is just a lot of stuff. Yeah. But there's a whole, where there's a lot of smoke, there's some fire. It's starting to add up, but not add up to a six game suspension. Right. If, if you're gonna go to six or eight or 10, right. you're gonna do domestic violence. Right. You're going to have to have details. Right. You're going to have to lay out uh, a very convincing case, and they well might here in a few minutes. They might. But here's the thing, Skip. How am I, and the NFL and Lisa Friel is looking at you like, Jerry, how can we believe your, your investigation? You said you had investigated Lucky Whitehead, Lucky Whitehead, and you felt real comfortable that he had done what he was alleged to have done and moved on. See, the reason, now look, Lucky Whitehead and Ezekiel Elliott, they're two different players. I, I know. Remember, I don't, it's apples to oranges because Lucky had several little minor things going on, and he's a minor contributor. But, but, right? here, but here's the thing. Not at, at any time during all those minor things did they release him. Even when he missed late for the flight, they suspended him. What did he do, Skip? He played the next week. He played in the playoffs. All those things that were going on, somehow the Cowboys were willing to overlook it this was... Okay, but just the week before, he had had the weird kidnap pit bull story. Yeah, they kidnapped the man dog, Skip. <laughs> okay. I mean, if somebody kidnapped Hazel, you pay all... You be all FS1, bring Hazel back. Bring Hazel back! Kidnapped by a Fort Worth rapper whose name <laughs> escapes me, but sorry. I asked yeah. Nelly if he'd heard of him. No, he hadn't heard of him. But anyway. Bugatti something? Yeah, Bugatti. Bugatti yeah. something. Yeah, okay. spelled like B-O-O. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing, though, Skip. So I'm just saying, once Jerry said there's nothing there... You know, why is he so adamant that there's nothing there? Why don't you just say, hey, do your investigation, and then I'll just let the chips fall where they may? But I don't know. Be You're right. You know why. Well, again, it, it was coming across to me, and I told you again and again, you're daring them, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You're challenging them ahead of the suspension to prove it. Yeah. Like, there's nothing yeah. there. I dare you to suspend my star running back and maybe one of the biggest stars you have now in your league. Right. Right? Yep. Salvation Army Kettle, Ezekiel yep. Elliott, Thanksgiving Day, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a what you call them. That's it's a penalty now, it's, now. It's a penalty. But Skip, I remember when we were growing up, my grandma used to tell us, boy, don't go in my closet. Mm -hmm. Why she didn't want us to go in that closet? What was in there? She had, I know. had money, oh. silver dollars. Oh, I thought you meant go in your closet. No, go oh, in her closet. Right. She had chewing tobacco, some snuff. It doesn't sound like he listened. Hmm. Oh! Did you get into it? <laughs> Mm. How'd you know all that she, was in there? All she had to do was just don't say anything, Skip, and I would have never done it. So I knew she was hiding something in that closet, and I needed to see. I don't know. Jerry sounded very confident about it, so there is a, a, a chance, I guess, that they know something that he doesn't know. Yeah, but I'm in pretty these sure. Specific situations with domestic violence, like you said, it's a he said, she said <sighs> situations. In most cases, unless there are a bunch of witnesses, so the police have limitations that maybe Lisa Friel doesn't maybe have. Not. No mercy. Before we move into the next topic, I want to bring in Skip and Shannon to tell you about a great offer for our listeners from Saks Underwear Company. Hey guys, you may think all underwear is created equal. Well then, you haven't tried Saks Underwear. Stop putting up with an uncomfortable pair you'll end up throwing out in a few months. Go with the quality and comfort offered by Saks. Whether you're traveling or working out or going head-to-head -head with an NFL Hall of Famer on TV every morning, Saks Underwear has what you need to stay cool and comfortable. Take it from a former Super Bowl champ. Comfort is very important when you work out. You don't want something too snug. You don't want something too loose. You want something that will absorb the moisture, but you feel comfortable in it. And the more comfortable you are when you work out, I believe the longer you will work out. And that's the most important thing. So I am glad I got an opportunity to try Saks Underwear Company and they're working great for me. 
Outside Magazine just had an article about how Saks has revolutionized underwear the same way Gore-Tex revolutionized jackets. And it's true. Saks has taken something we all need and made it better. Quality, support, and comfort. Everything you need. We want you to try Saks Underwear with our special limited time deal. Go to our URL, saxunderwear.com slash undisputed, and you'll get 20% off your first purchase. Pick up a few pairs. That's Saks with two X's, S-A-X-X, underwear.com slash undisputed for 20% off your first purchase. Thanks, guys. That's saxunderwear.com slash undisputed for 20% off your first purchase. That's sax with two X's. One more time, that's saxunderwear.com slash undisputed. Now back to the show. No mercy. Jimmy Garoppolo got the start for the Patriots in their first preseason game last night. Garoppolo threw for 235 yards and two touchdown passes. Jimmy G will be a free agent at the end of the season, while Tom Brady turned 40 last week. Shannon? What impact did last night have on Belichick's thinking about his quarterback situation? I think it confirmed what he already knew, that he would be in good hands if Tom Brady was a step away. Um, Coach Belichick doesn't have to worry about whether or not Jimmy Garoppolo would be good in anybody else's system. He knows he can play in that system. And we've seen guys before look good when they come in, and when they go other places, they're not, not the same. So Coach Belichick doesn't need to worry about, well, he can't play for that team or he's just a guy, he's just a system guy. Well, as long as Coach Belichick's there and Josh McDaniel's going to run the system that's been there in place for 18 years, Jimmy Garoppolo will be just fine. So I don't see him, and I'm sure there are a lot of teams after watching that performance last night, Skip, saying we'd love to get our hands on Jimmy Garoppolo. But I believe Jimmy is worth more to the Patriots than he is to someone else because Something were to happen to Tom Brady, Skip, you don't want anything, and I'm not wishing I'm knock on wood, said I don't want anything to happen to Tom. But if something were to ta- happen to Tom, Jacoby Brissett is not Jimmy Garoppolo. I believe if something were to happen to Tom, the Patriots would still be the favorite to win the Super Bowl because they have well, Coach that's Belichick. It's a mouthful you just said. Absolutely. I still believe they would be the favorite. Is that be- some Brady hate that just No, 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 no. It don't hate no Brady, huh? but Coach Belichick. And that defense, and Josh McDaniel will dial up the plays, and he does a great job of calling plays. Now, you can get away with a lot more things when you have Tom Brady as your quarterback, but if you watch Jimmy Garoppolo and the way they call plays with him, and then when Jacoby Brissett came in and where they call plays for him, they tailor their offense to the quarterback. Now, obviously, Tom Brady, you know, you have the whole, the entire playbook open, and I believe you have a large part of the playbook open with Jimmy Garoppolo. But from what I've seen, Skip, I feel real comfortable in saying that Jimmy Garoppolo will be the starting quarterback in 2018 for the Patriots. Mm. I do agree with your bottom line to this. But before I answer Joy's question, just a quick aside, the throw of the night came from Jimmy G last night, but Mm -hmm. it it wasn't such a great throw. It was a great catch. It was. By somebody named Austin Carr. Check that out. Austin Carr. I thought there was only one Austin Carr in sports, right? (laughs) We had him on our show (laughs) in Cleveland, right? Yep. And he was a great Cleveland Cavalier, and now he is a great broadcaster for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And there he was, undrafted out of Northwestern. And guess what, Shannon? Yep. Patriots strike again. Another Amendola, another Edelman, another Chris Hogan. There he is. Yep. 6'1", 195, so he's not that little. But look at that catch. Yep. Wow, that looked like That's Shannon Sharp. That's a good number, Skip, the 84. I, I was thinking of you last night. <laughs> yeah, when I saw it was 84, I thought, wow, yeah. who, who knows, you know, maybe. But, again, this is what they do, undrafted. But he was really – he made first-team All-Big Ten at Northwestern, so he's perfect right. for them. Right. Now, back to Jimmy G. I didn't watch the game last night. I just saw the highlights. But – Every time I watch him, he looks really good. Yes. And his body language is really authoritative. Like he is in total command of the offense and in total command of his emotions. He he was rocking and firing in the highlights I saw. Yes. Big arm. You know, he's got a good personality. I'm sure he could be somebody's face of the franchise. Mm -hmm. Good looking kid. He's got it all. Got the whole package. So, to me... I'm, I'm wondering last night, man, that was a showcase because 
in game number one, Jimmy G played two and a half quarters. In fact, a little more than two and a half. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of football mm -hmm. for game number one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Brady wasn't going to play. Right. But what is the method to the madness? What are you doing, Coach Belichick? Are you trying to market him for trade? Maybe, but I'm with you. I think mostly you're trying to condition Patriot Nation to see enough of Jimmy G that he can light it up, 22 or 28, to say, there's the future. Mm -hmm. That's the guy who's going to replace the, the beloved number 12. And I'm with you. I think we're heading toward signing Jimmy G after this season and that he will be the starting quarterback next year. And I believe it's because Bill Belichick, who's now, I think, 65, wants a shot because he thinks he's earned a shot at winning a championship with no Tom Brady. Right. Brady, get, you know, to me, I give Brady 75% of the credit. You think it's more like advantage Belichick somehow, Correct. right? 60-40. Mm -hmm. So, to me, it's laughable to think that Jimmy G could take them to the Super Bowl this year if he got thrown in. I got a knock on wood again for terrible reasons. But – it's just too much too soon, especially he, he wouldn't win as many games in the regular season, so they might not have home field advantage in the playoffs, and he would struggle in the playoffs. That's just me, but I think he's going to be a very good quarterback. Do I think he's going to be Tom Brady? I do not. Is there some fear that if you traded two first-rounders or whatever you had to give for him, that, that he would prove to be a little bit of a product of the Patriots, the way we've seen that happen before? Although Matt Castle, he did make a Pro Bowl in Kansas City, and then he was a disaster in Dallas. Oh, from the castle to the outhouse, as I used to say, right? Ice cream, sand castle. Uh, yeah, sand castle. <laughs> but in, in this case, he's throwing a bunch of guys, who, you know, Austin Carr, maybe he'll be the next guy, but I don't think he's going to contribute this year. And, and then somebody named Jacob, Jacob Hollister caught seven balls for 116 yards. A new Shannon Sharp, a new Gronk. I don't know. He's a tight end. And that's the thing, though, Skip. You only got – I mean, they traded, they traded for Brandon Cook. Yeah. They got Mitchell, who played big for him last year. You have Edelman, Amendola. You got Hogan. Are you going to really carry seven wide receivers? Practice squad. Well, if you release them, somebody else might sign them. Yeah. Or that, is that the risk you really run? Now, 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 they could – I've seen players get an opportunity to go sign somewhere else but stay – because they're comfortable in that situation mm -hmm. because they believe they're in the right situation. By the way, I like Malcolm Mitchell, too. Yeah, good, and, and, good and so th yeah. that's the... I mean, it's, but, they're loaded. But, Skip, when you look at him in this offense, have we ever seen a backup quarterback in any system look like Steve, Steve Young? But back then, you could keep a guy, Skip. He couldn't go anywhere. You had his rights. Yep. Now he's seeing all these guys making 18 $20 million. You don't think that Jimmy Garoppolo thinks he's as good as Kirk Cousins? Or he's as good as these guys that's making 18, 20 million dollars a year. I believe he thinks he's better. Absolutely. Yep. So he's not going to just you coach. Well, you know, just stay a couple more. He's like, no. And he said it. I'm not used to being a backup. I want to be a starter. I want to compete to be a starter. I don't blame him. I, what? Mm. I, hey, <laughs> Skip. Mm -hmm. You see, he just saw Mike Glenn stink to join up. It got 15 million last year. He's like, man, I, I, I know I'm better than him. Mm. And he ain't lying. He was stinking the joint up before he got 15 million. I mean, I don't get it, but whatever. Well, Skip, that's how they got Jameis Winston. Because he stunk it up so bad, Tampa got the number one overall draft pick. Because if he could play, he would still be in Tampa, and Jameis Winston would. Maybe that's their strategy. Mm. Maybe that's what Maybe. it was. Huh? <laughs> uh, I, saw, I saw Mike Glennon stink it up against my Vanderbilt Commodores in a bowl game. That's how bad he was. Yeah. Wow. Jamie, uh, I don't know. And you saw Tom looking over his shoulder. Sit down, Tom. You're not in the game. Put the headset on. He was cheerleading. No, don't be looking over that man's huh? shoulder. He should have shot him a quick bone like that. He was rooting for him. You know, you, hey, Tom has nothing to worry about. Hey, yo, you know, you, you're in the crowd there. Back up. <clears throat> yep. Excuse me. Tom Brady is going to be on the market, I believe, a year from today or whenever they decide to do it. Jimmy. Huh? I, I, I'm thinking, Skip. I mean, from what I've seen in that offense, and Coach Bell, like I said, I think Coach Bell, what is two first-rounders, Skip? Let's just say for the sake of argument, you trade, trade Jimmy Garoppolo for two first-round picks, and you keep Tom, and a year later he steps off a cliff. Then wh where are you? Nowhere. I would agree with that. <laughs> it's not a good trade-off. No. Nope. It, it doesn't work, which is why I'm hoping Mr. Kraft – gives Tom Brady what he has earned, which is a nice parting gift of just release him and let him pick. Nah, just give him $20 million and yeah. tell him to go retire. Well, 
go retire? Yeah, twenty million. He doesn't want to. He's going to play five more years, and he's going to make you eat a whole bunch of crow because he's going to go win Tom, a Super Bowl elsewhere. Either you elsewhere. Re- either you retire or you go into Jacksonville or Cincinnati. We'd love to have you in Miami, Tom. No, you ain't going to no nice weather. <laughs> Huh? Jacksonville or Cincinnati. Tired well, then South Florida. Jacksonville or Cincinnati is going to win a Super Bowl. Skip, you, you need... watch. You watch. I can't even believe you, Skip. Well, have you checked him out? Just look at the little you clips go... you see from camp. Does he not look good? We... Does his body not look great? When we go to break, you need to go off stage and, and say, well, forgive me for what I just said because <laughs> they... I know Jacksonville ain't going to win. Tom believes I, I'm not. I... Tom, I, I believe. Him. Brady. No mercy. Joined now by Joel Klatt. Welcome, Joel. Good to be here. How oh. you guys doing? We're, I mean, it's so close, guys. It's so close to the scene. <laughs> got two weeks. I, lo- I, can't, I can't. I'm jumping out of my Oh, I thought you right did now. this topic was so well, close. Well, because I can't wait. The topic, but yeah, yeah, I bet you can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joel, you unveiled your Heisman prediction this yeah. morning on FoxSports.com, and you have a surprise pick. So I do. Tell us who it is. I do. Well, first of all, I, I do want to get a couple of guys out there because there's one guy that no one talks about that I think is going to have a really good shot to at least be in New York and is a dark horse to actually win the trophy depending on what happens with some of the front runners. Quentin Flowers from South Florida, the quarterback. Huh? It, it, Quentin Flowers is a great player. Oh, wow. Listen to these numbers. Only Lamar Jackson surpassed these numbers a year ago. 1,500 yards rushing. He had 2,800 yards passing. He threw for 62%. This guy... Uh, he 24 touchdowns throwing the football, and they're probably going to be undefeated. They've got a schedule that they can go undefeated with, so Quentin Flowers, that's a name to watch mm. out for during the course of the season. Then three guys that I think are just New York locks, Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, and Sam Darnold. Lamar Jackson is the seventh returning Heisman Trophy winner since 2000. Guys, it's incredibly difficult to win the trophy as an incumbent, and that's why it's going to be difficult for Lamar Jackson. He's already got people that – don't believe he's as good of a thrower as he needs to be in order to, you know, come back and win that trophy. And then my pick, and this one might be a little bit off the radar, my pick is Mason Rudolph from Oklahoma State. I know you can say Sam Darnold all you want, but I think Sam oh. Darnold is going to fall into the Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck category. Like Lamar Jackson, the target is way too big on their back. I can't believe you said this. Mason Rudolph from Oklahoma State's got four great wide receivers, one elite wide receiver in James Washington. They've got a schedule where they're likely going to be undefeated when they face Oklahoma in November, and he's going to put up monster numbers. Just enough (laughs) off the radar to impress people, but just enough on the radar to actually win the trophy. We have just experienced history on what Undisputed. What this happened? is the first time Don't you and I me. agree it... on something that is oh way goodness. off the board. I thought you want Baker Mayfield. I, uh, I want him. I like him. And I don't like Oklahoma State. They've been no my rival. You ruined my day. Hey, George, you got no chance. No, ruined my I, day. I'm serious. <laughs> I've been telling our producers, we haven't done it yet on air, but I've been saying – I'm going with Mason Rudolph because he's got the best receiving core in the nation, and something tells me that team is on the verge. Yeah. And the schedule sets up perfectly, dare I say, for them to win every game. Say, come They're going to have a good chance. Yeah. They're going to have with that offense. If they play any semblance of defense, they very well could wind up in the playoff. Barkley, that running back from Penn State. Ooh, you he picking is him? so good. He's going to be in, he's gonna be in uh, New York. Okay, yeah. but not to win at all? Uh, that, it's hard for a running back unless you do Derrick Henry 2,000 yeah. yards and you win the – if they win 2,000 yards and win the Big Ten, yeah. What a okay. nice, pleasant start, Joel. Yeah, well, I don't know if green. it's nice. Now I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> well, don't worry. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about in the next topic, and you can check all that out on FoxSports.com with Joel. A very interesting poll was released this week. CBS Sports interviewed about 25 current college football coaches, and they voted Jim Harbaugh as the most overrated coach in the country. Nick Saban came in – tied for second on the list, and an anonymous coach said about Nick Saban, Nick's got a lot of advantages. In my conference, you could take five or six of us and get there a month before the season and win 12 games. There's a little bleeping machine underneath that stadium, (laughs) and they grow them there. Interesting. Mm. Joel, are Harbaugh and Saban overrated? No, that's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever seen. First of all, that poll, you have to understand now, 50% of the coaches just declined to answer the question period. Well, and 48. 48. So I, I rounded <laughs> yeah. up. I rounded up. Um, th- this answer is born out of envy and jealousy. That, I mean, that's what it is. It's basically like saying, I don't like their hustle. These coaches just don't like them. They don't like that they've got the salaries that they've got. They don't like the places that they coach. The, the statement that you could take five coaches and go down there and win this year is somewhat true. 
only if Nick Saban was the one that got the players there in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest mm -hmm. part of this. The biggest part of college football is recruiting, and these two guys do it as well as anybody out there. Urban Meyer does it as well as anybody out there. And as far as Harbaugh being overrated, I know people don't like his style and the way that he goes about it, and he's got the outfit on and the hat on and all of that, and I understand that, okay? Look at what he's done over the course of his career. He went to the University of San Diego and made them a perennial power in their conference. He goes to Stanford, they're plus three in the win column his first year, ultimately going from 1-11 to 12-1 and one and Orange Bowl champions. He goes to the San Francisco 49ers, they're plus seven in the win column immediately and lose in overtime in the NFC Championship game and become a team that's within five yards of winning a Super Bowl. He goes to Michigan, they're immediately plus five in the win column. He's the only thing that is changing at these places and he immediately makes them better. That is not overrated. In fact, in my book, he's underrated because people write him off because he doesn't have a ring. He's one of the best coaches in college football. I can't even believe I got to answer this, that I got to speak on this young man's behalf. Well, he's not a young man anymore. But for someone to say Nick Saban, St. Nick is overrated with what he's done at that program. Now, I understand what the, the, the roll tide were under Coach Bryant in the 60s and the 70s because I'm old enough to remember him coaching. I remember when he retired and said he'd be dead on the, within a year, and I think it was about three months, Skip. Yep. I know what Alabama uh, was under Coach Stallings in the mid-'90s, but if you look at that stretch from when Coach Bryant passed until when Coach Stallings took over and from Coach Stallings to Nick Saban, Skip, it's not even close. The team before Coach, Coach Saban got there was 6-7. and seven. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, he got there in January. He, re he missed the recruiting season. So within three years, guess what he had on his finger, Skip? National mm. champions. That's what he can do. The whole part about coaching college football is can you go get those thoroughbreds to run this race with? He can do it. They want to go to Alabama because Alabama's they hadn't left Tus Tuscaloosa. Right. They've been playing in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, but those guys didn't want to come. Now he's there. He's won everywhere he's been. He went to Michigan State. He won. LSU, he won a national title, left to go to Miami, and guess what? Les Miles won a national championship with his players. Les Miles never won another national championship. He comes back to Alabama, and now he's like the Tiger Woods. You got Alabama or the field for the national championship because you, they don't expect to play for the SEC title, which is hard. They expect to play for national titles. Mm -hmm. And for someone to say, oh, I can take, I can take five or six of my guys, yeah, as Joel said, I'm going to say it live for the people in the back because they ain't hear you. Yeah, if Nick Saban get those players, <laughs> but could you get them if you were at Alabama? And you see what he said? Oh, we can go down there with Alabama the month before the season. Yeah, because Nick Saban's already prepared the meal. All you want to do is sit down and eat. You should be ashamed of yourself. Mm. I don't know who the coaches are, but you're haters. Mm. And guess what? Mm. You're going to hate again because you're going to be back in the national championship mm. again. Really? I'll yeah. Take, I'll take the field. You give me the field? Take whatever you want. You're going to take this butt cutting, too. Yeah. <laughs> Jalen Hurts, a sophomore now. And how do you feel about the number one most overrated coach, Jim Harbaugh? Huh? Ding, ding. You, you... I, well, he's not totally overrated. Here's the thing. I'm a little disappointed because he had an opportunity to play get into the college finals. They lost three of their last four games. Quarterback they... got hurt, but go ahead. Look at the quarter. Look at the quarterbacks that Nick Saban's winning national championships with. Give him. A, can you imagine if he had a Lamar Jackson? If he had a Deshaun Watson, what would Alabama be? They would not. They would not lose a game. They would not lost a game in four years. John Elway was sniffing around AJ McCarron two days ago. Yeah. You don't know that. You I, to get, I think he was. You trying to get me? I can't get no free meals at Elway's restaurant. You I know? ain't saying nothing. <laughs> I don't believe it. You don't want to be he fake, said, fake news. news. <laughs> fake news. I don't think it was fake, but that's just me. Because A.J. McCarron's he is. pretty good. I he believe he would be an upgrade good. over what they have. That is correct. I think he might be sniffing a little bit harder this morning after watching Maybe. the performance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He might be. So, I am completely with Joel about Jim Harbaugh. He, he is my favorite college coach because he hasn't just put Michigan back on the map. It's all anybody talks about is Harbaugh, Harbaugh, Harbaugh because he, he's – crazily brilliant at just getting involved in this and that, these crazy things, sleepovers with his recruits, and it will start to pay off as he starts to wean the program off the Brady Hoke recruits and onto the Harbaugh recruits. Mm -hmm. They are going straight north. They've gone 10-3 and three and 10-3. and three. 
They won a bowl game the first year. They lost last year in the Orange Bowl, 33-32. to 32. They're moving north quickly, and they're going right. to be a force, and I believe he will win a national championship at Michigan before he is through there, if not more than one. Now, to the other guy, I'm going to tell you again, St. Nick ain't Nick. And I wanted just one anonymous quote to say the truth, which was, there are just too many defensive disasters. Oh there are goodness. too many big stage collapses. I get all you say. And he's done great things, and he has done nightmarish things coaching Alabama's defense in big stage games, in an Orange Bowl against Trevor Knight, an Iron Bowl, and the two Deshaun games in which Deshaun rolled up almost 500 yards. And I, I beat this to death. I don't have time. I'm not going to go back through the litany of them just over the last four years. But you can't tell me he's the best defensive coach in football when he has the best pipeline in football to the NFL. Every year it's like three or four go in the first round. And yet you get torched by Deshaun Watson in the championship game twice, you barely won one thanks to an onside kick that you called and you lost last year on the last second play to Deshaun Watson and you are the hands-on coach of the secondary. Really? That's overrated, man. No. Yes. I, I, you know what? I'm going to give you something. I'm going to agree with you on the defensive coach part. Can't say he's like the best defensive coach. You know why? Because just throw defensive out. He's just the best coach, period. Now. Nah. If you okay, go back, you, are you just saying best recruiter? Period. No, no, no. Coach, no. the best coach. coach. He Recru might be the best in history. Think about what I'm about to tell you now. I'm going to say I save this till the end because I just want to end this once and for all. In 1972. <laughs> Good luck with that. I'm, well, yeah. Just get ready. In right. 1972, the NCAA, the NCAA reduced the scholarships to 105. Before that, it was unlimited scholarships. If your school could afford it, you could throw 150 guys on scholarships. All right, so. Really, modern college football started in 1972 with 105 scholarships. I'll buy that. In 78, it went to 95, and then in 1992, it went down to the current 85 scholarship model. If you go back to 1972, there's been only four coaches that have won a national title at the same school six years apart. Now, I bring that up because it's incredibly difficult because you've got to do it over two cycles of recruits. You've got to have longevity, and you've got to be able to develop twice and sometimes three times. Those coaches are Barry Switzer at Oklahoma, Bear Bryant at Alabama, Bobby Bowden and Nick Saban, and Bowden and Saban are the only two to do it after the scholarships were reduced to 85. And Saban's got five national championships. The only coach to win more is Bear Bryant. And he won some of those before there were scholarship limits. And Nick the Saban's the greatest coach in our sports history. And the data bears that out. Greatest recruiter, I will give you. They are loaded year after year. But if I go back through the litany of big stage disasters, the Ezekiel Elliott game, you say, what is that? You just keep sweeping it under carpet, Look sweeping it under Ezekiel carpet. Ezekiel Elliott. Well, this, did you see? He's an all-pro. They said when, he got 230 all yards on 20 carries. They say when Coach Saban rolled up in that that Mercedes Benz, guess what he's playing on the radio, Skip? I got five on <laughs> it. <God. laughs> Not what he got he's on been it. Preparing that all day. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you check out Joel's loony? Heisman pick on Fox. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that Joel, thanks for joining. Us. Uh, no mercy. Tim Tebow is still in single A, playing with the St. Lucie Mets. Right now, he's hitting 248 with five homers. Tebow's former coach, Urban Meyer, was asked about his baseball career and said, when I first heard he was trying baseball, I did question it. I know how hard it is. You can't just tough your way through baseball. There's a skill set. Football is different. There are going to be critics out there who say that this is bad for baseball. Go explain it to me again. Why is it bad for baseball? Explain that to me. Will he make it? You need to give me the definition of making it. If it's a Hall of Famer, if it's Major League Baseball, if it's AAA Baseball. I played it in the minors. It's really, really hard. I think he's already made it in some ways. Skip, do you agree with Urban? Obviously, Mr. Sharp, I agree with Urban Meyer. But he made some profound points, and I thought he cut to the heart of what I've long believed about Tim Tebow. That is that the world is divided between people who really love and believe in Tim Tebow and there are a lot of those. Yes. And a whole nother huge segment of the population who despise everything Tim Tebow, everything about him. He just rubs those people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And the twain shall never meet. You're mostly on the other side. I've been on the believer side in Tim Tebow. 
and Urban's first point was that he's just a guy that you learn not to bet against. And obviously, Urban loves him in part because he and Tim won two national championships Correct. together at Florida. And I do think he just likes him as a human Perfect. being. Yeah. But he went on to say, when Tim puts his laser focus on something, he's going to do it. No amount of time, no amount of injury, no amount of pain is going to get in the way of that. Hmm. His greatest gift is his toughness. <clears throat> and he means both his physical and his mental toughness. Then Urban goes on to say that there's nothing phony about Tim Tebow. And that's what I've said from the start. You, you can despise his religion, evangelical Christians, whatever. That, that's fine. That's your right. His kneel, kneeling, Tebowing, wearing his religion on his sleeve. If you want to resent that, hate it, whatever, that's fine. But the point is, it's very real. And Urban says, from A to Z, what he's living is real. Because Urban said he spent eight hours a day around him every day for those, what was it, four, four years. years. And I've been around him enough to know, not eight hours a day, but enough right. to know. Mm -hmm. He's legit, man. He walks his talk. Right. And then he talks about Tebow's critics, and he says, sometimes I look at the critics, and, and I wonder what the real issue is here, because I do too. I'm not sure what's not to like about him. And then he gets to his, th this definition of making it in baseball. Has he, has he made it? Well, what does it mean? Is, does it mean, do, do you make it if you get to the Hall of Fame, or get to the major leagues, or get to AAA, says Urban, or just do what he's been doing so far, in not even a full season yet in the minor leagues, class low A and then high A ball. And I'm with him because Urban played minor league baseball back in 82 and 83, and as he said, it is really hard. So just the mere fact that he had the guts, as I told you from the start, to try to go do something professionally that he didn't, that didn't even play amateurishly, amateurly since his junior year in high school, 12 years passed, and he'd never picked up, uh, I don't know, he probably swung a bat somewhere in some batting mm -hmm. practice or home run derby. But the point is that w what he's done so far, and his numbers have improved at, at St. Lucie, which is high A ball, they're not great, but they're, they're pretty good. And the point is he's having the guts to go out there every night and pull off something that I think very few professional athletes could pull off, to leave the NBA or the NFL and go to the sport of baseball if they hadn't played it since high school, and then go compete against these bonus baby kids at low and high A ball, or for that matter, at the, in the fall league, those, were, those kids are on the doorstep of getting to the big leagues, and he was really good. His, his last sort of month of the fall league, he went nine for his last 32, which you know is a 425 on base percentage. That was really good against top flight pitching. So... It, it, no one's giving him any credit, or very few are giving him credit for just just trying. He, he's starting over at age 29. I mean, but it's hard. Here. It's baseball is the hardest game to learn no, to no, figure no, out. No, 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 no. We yeah. don't do participation here. You're not in kindergarten. You're not in Head Start. If you come to school every day, you get a, you get a perfect attendance. Mm -hmm. If you do good on a test, you get a star. That ain't what we do here. You're at the professional level. So let me get this right. Urban Meyer said when Tim puts his laser, laser focus on, there's nothing he couldn't accomplish. So he didn't have laser focus, so he couldn't learn how to play the quarterback position better than what he played? God, he was great in Denver. When somebody gave him a real chance to play Skip. out of desperation. So great. So one That was one of the great runs in NFL history. Skip. History. Skip. Seriously. Skip, you don't get to build a career on a run. You get to build a career on a resume, on a body of work, or a continual. 13 not games? Skip, stop. Well, man. then nobody ever gave him a chance. Who gave him a chance yeah, after see, that? Help see, me out. See, now, see, there Where you go. did he get a chance? This, this, is, this is why. Because, see, the same people that said Tim Tebow never got a chance are applauding Colin Kaepernick for not getting a chance. Okay, well, don't make it a Kaepernick no, I'm, thing. I'm just, I get it, because they I, don't belong in the same sentence. But, Skip, you can't... I have nothing. I don't... You know, my thing is, I don't like or dislike Tim Tebow. I, like the, I dislike the opportunity that he get presented for some unknown reason. Okay, you know what, since you brought up Kaepernick, see, I, I take it to heart in a different way than you do. Tebow got, quote-unquote, blackballed just the way Kaepernick is for very different reasons, yeah. but he got rejected in large part 
because of his religion. He wore it on his sleeve. He became a distraction because the, the media, mostly left-wing media, didn't like it. So they're constantly criticizing it, and so it became a distraction for the Jets and for the Eagles and for the briefly with the Patriots to where the NFL says, we don't want that in our locker room. We don't want his, his presence in our locker room. He's too... To, he, the force of it is too big because the media comes to rip Tim Tebow. We don't want that around. So in large part, because of his faith, he got rejected by the National Football League. Well, see, I look at it differently because I believe, thir I believe Tim Tebow played 11 games and Colin Kaepernick has had a larger body of work. Well, but sure. That's not here no, there. no I, but, I got it. But since, so since we, what is the, he, I believe he's made it. So when you grow up saying, you know what, I just want to play single A. I want to play high A ball. That's it. Well, he's not finished. He's just getting started. Um, well, I mean, so, he's, he's so not going to so, stop. So what does Urban Meyer say he's made it? In, 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 is he talking about baseball or is he talking about football? He's talking about a guy who started over at age 29 and is putting up the numbers he is at high A ball. To, to Urban, that's that's already making it. That's showing that you belong at high A. Skip, if the, if the he's guy become a contributor for the St. Lucie Mets. I get it, Skip. I'm impressed when an 80 year old or 70 year old go back to college and they get their degree. This is not impressing me, Skip. It's impressing you, but it's not impressing me. You know why? Because the thing was, normally people don't get an opportunity. If you fail at something professionally, they don't allow you after 10, 11 years of not playing to go ahead and do something else. But he got that opportunity. Well, you could if you wanted to go try. Skip. Well, if you'd been a big star in college football and you'd made a, an incredible run in pro football as a quarterback, and you took a team from 1-4 and four to a division title and won a home playoff game against Ben Roethlisberger, yeah. If then you wanted to go to a baseball camp and they'd say, we'll give you a shot, we'll give you a you chance. Didn't, you didn't get one. Tim, huh? Tebow, Tim Tebow got that because of it. And, and get look, look, Skip, he moves the needle. He generates dollars. And in a capitalistic society, in a free market society, that's what, that's what people and, 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 and teams and, and, and endorsers and sponsors, that's what they want. He can move the needle. I, I got no, I, you're not going to get no, any debate from me on that issue. But to sit here and say, oh, oh, he's made it because he's in high A ball or he skipped. He was not successful. He was a first-round draft pick that basically had one year in the National Football League. He's a bust. As an NFL player, he's, he's a, a bust. Yes, he is, Skip. Well, what about his last three games the, the previous year in Denver? Go look at the numbers and tell me what you see. So what, so go, 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 go check out the comeback against the Houston Texans in the middle of those three games. Go look at the opener, the, his first game ever at Oakland. Go, yeah. go look at it. But, go but tell me what you yeah, see. He played two NFL seasons. Two. Okay, but every time he got a chance, again, out of desperation, the new regime, again, he wasn't drafted by John Elway. Correct. The new regime said, let's get this over with. Let's get it out of our hair. And you know the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. All he did was win right. and win and win and win. Well, think of, they won the division. Skip, how do you go to practice and you tell them, let him complete the passes? You tell him, don't break the passes. You're telling the defensive guys, don't do this. What happened, Where did they do that out, Skip? What happened when the lights were brightest Skip, in the fourth I, quarter? First of all, Skip, you don't get an opportunity to show how, light, how good you can do when the lights are bright if you can't. Skip, he couldn't complete passes in practice. They're telling the defensive players, let the guys catch the football. Pass rushers, do not bat the ball down. Do not get close to him because he's going to take off running. We want him to go through the progression, Skip. Come on now, Skip. Hey. Let's be fair with this. Hey, against my Oklahoma Sooners in the fourth quarter of the Skip, National that's Championship college. game, it's not just college. It's the National Championship game. He was spectacular throwing the football. Can I ask you a question, Skip? How many Heisman Trophy quarterbacks are in the Hall of Fame? Roger Staubach? Yeah, he's a good one. How many Heisman Trophy quarterbacks won uh, a Super Bowl? What is it? If you win the Heisman, are you disqualified from playing pro football? No, I'm just trying to tell you. That's what I'm telling you. You can be the greatest college player and win the Heisman and not be a great pro. So he wasn't a great pro. Boy, but you're trying to make, oh, it, he, had, it, he had 11 good games, so that, that, that it, validates. It, no, it doesn't validate it. If you told me it was two, I'd give it to you. But it was 13 games. 13 wow. games? Wow. They play 16. It's a lot. Skip. It's a lot. Skip. For a team that's just dead in the water, Skip. one and four. Skip. He was a first-round draft pick. As a first-round drafted player, you should be in the Pro Bowl by mm -hmm. your third year. By his third year, he was out of the league. How is that success? 
the Broncos rejected him because suddenly who fell into their lap out of heaven above? Okay, did Jeff Peyton Manning. Okay, did Jeff okay, I'll give you that one. Okay. I'll take Peyton okay. Manning did over. Jeff rejected him. Why? Okay, they lied to him. Ask him. Ask okay. him if they didn't okay. lie to okay. him. The they never gave him okay. one chance to play okay. quarterback. Okay, the Patriots rejected him. No, now, the, 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 guy the Eagles. The Eagles next. Hold on. The, 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 uh, uh, okay, the Eagles. Yep. Now, here's an offense. And by the way, I thought he played pretty well for the Eagles in no, the preseason. I, I was shocked. I was on your old show, and I told you he yeah. wouldn't make it. But they rejected him. Chip Kelly ran the offense that he ran in college mm -hmm. and said that instead of signing Tebow, he would sign someone off the street. street. That's neither here nor there. The Patriots, the offensive coordinator at the Patriots, drafted Tim Tebow, traded the first-round pick the next year to select Tim Tebow. They said no. Too big a distraction. The media... Oh like flock to Foxborough in ways they don't ever flock to Foxborough, oh. even for the champion. You know it and I know Skip, it. Skip, you can't continuously make excuses for him. It's okay. I'm not making excuses. Can, I don't have to make excuses for what he did when he was the starting quarterback. Two things can be true. You can be a, a, a not a good football player and a very good person. You can be a very bad person and a very good football player. How do you They're, win games if you're a bad football player? So You can't win if, if you have a bad he quarterback. Won games. He what? did not. He didn't win no a games, so he's over. He, he had a hard time. So right Mark, away. Did Mark Sanchez win any games? Did Ryan Fitzpatrick? Has Brian Hoyer? Mark had, Sanchez is pretty good. You know it and I know it. He's pretty good. He played really well in those playoff games for Jets. Yeah, good that defense. was his first two years. The Denver Broncos were one and four. Think about that. One and four. You would think you'd have a little more love for him if yeah. the Broncos. He saved your bacon that year. <laughs> he saved it. No mercy. Big news. We're going to Vegas. We will be live yeah. right outside of T-Mobile Arena yeah. on August 24th and 25th to get ready for Connor versus Ooh. Floyd. You can come watch the show in person in the audience if you're in Vegas. Skip, how excited are you to be there? We're going to turn up. Yeah, at, that's at, what I'm talking at, about. At 9.30 Eastern time, 6.30 a.m. in Las Vegas. That's when the party's going to start. Thursday morning, 6.30 a.m. Pacific time in Las Vegas. Nah, I ride Wednesday with my solo yeah. cup. I'm turning up Wednesday night. Oh, as long as you make it there in the morning. Oh, I'll be yeah. there. I'm going to sleep where we where, where we at. <laughs> right outside the T-Mobile arena. Oh, well, I'm going to sleep. I'm gonna, they fly me in a sleeping bag. <laughs> Just wake me up, Skip. Let me know what time we're going on That's a good idea. Vegas has taken down some of the best of us. But we're excited. <laughs> we hope to see you there. Come and see the show in person. And like Skip said, we're going to turn up. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this fight. It's just 15 days away. Yesterday, Mayweather had his official workout in front of the media and had plenty to say about Connor. Let's take a listen. Do you have to finish him for this to feel like a win for you? Because I've heard some people say if he goes the distance, that's a victory for him. It is a victory for him. If he goes the distance, it's a victory for him. And my eyes are some if you get the eight ounce or the ten ounce gloves, do you still uh, do you predict a knockout? Um, if he's going, I'm saying that he he believes that it's not going to go past four, and I believe that it's not going to go the distance at all. So he feels one way, I feel another way. We're both uh, we're both confident in our skills, and we'll just have to see. When you met in London at all in the hangar area, did you talk to him? No, when I see him in New York, um, they show in New York. I let him know, like, straight up. I, I'm, I'm letting everybody know what I said. I said, what's up, little dude? And whoever know, I said, what's up, little dude? He was with all his guys. And at that particular time, I was just with all my female friends. You know how, you know, you know, you know how I say, <laughs> having, having one is too close to having none. So I had about, I, you know, I had about, I had about four, I had about four of my girls, four of my girls. I think I had about four, four or five of my girls with me. And then my daughter was with me. And I was letting him know, you know, I, I, with or without my security or out my team, I'm still tough. You know, I ain't no I ain't no punk. I'm just letting you know that. So I still said something to him. I said, what's up, little dude? Just to see if he wanted to pop off like he was popping off when he was on stage. What did he say? Oh, he ain't say nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you Floyd. Turn up on it, Floyd. Unintentional comedy mm -hmm. at its best. Floyd pulled up on it. Yeah, he pulled up on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Skip, what was your takeaway? I'm going to take these in order. <laughs> My overall takeaway is, seriously, this is big psychological advantage Conor McGregor because clearly he is getting deeper and deeper under Floyd Mayweather's skin. So let's go back to the if it goes the distance. Well, obviously, I, I agree with Floyd. I don't know if he really believes this in his heart of hearts, but if it goes the distance, George Foreman made this point a month ago. 
it's a disgrace for Floyd Mayweather. I mean, he's the, what, a lot of people say, greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighter ever, greatest defensive fighter ever. You would let some MMA refugee take you 12 rounds? Really? It'd be a disgrace. It would be a taint on his resume, even though it would go to 50 and 0. You, you couldn't dispense with this guy. So then he got his pride up and he said, yeah, he's been saying it's going to be over inside four rounds. Well, that's true, says Floyd, because I will say that it'll be over. I'll say when it's going to be over. And so I'm pretty sure I'm reading between the lines. He's predicting that he's going to knock out Conor McGregor inside of four rounds. No, no, no. Yes, he is. Skip, yes, he is. Said, Skip, you said Conor says he's going to knock me out inside of four rounds. I'm saying it's not going to go the distance. So it might be round five. It might be round ten. But Conor... But he says it'll, it'll end in four because I say it ends in four, meaning I'm going to end it, not him. No. Shannon... It's okay. You're call. getting in deeper and deeper hot water. It's okay. Mm -mm. It's okay. Mm. But clearly, if in fact Floyd thinks he could end it in four, that would requ require Floyd Mayweather to immediately engage in high-risk, high-reward, hand-to-hand combat in the middle of the ring. Right? Yeah. You're going to have to take the fight to him. Yeah. He said the other day, I'm going to take it to him. Really? Advantage Connor. That's really his only hope. If it goes 12 rounds, there's no way the judges are going to reward Conor McGregor, some MMA fighter, with a decision over Floyd Mayweather in Floyd's backyard in the T-Mobile Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, which Floyd basically owns and runs. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. That part is already, quote-unquote, rigged. Cannot beat him in his backyard if it goes to the judges. So Conor's only hope is to get Floyd out of his comfort zone into... Fisticuffs, man. Let's throw. Throw down. Middle of the ring. Let's see who's who's the biggest and baddest here. Little man? He called him a little man? Little dude? Really? Mm -hmm. So, to me, that's... Conor McGregor's already winning the fight psychologically because he's getting him to, to, to think about engaging. Now, I don't know if it's just, you know, uh, sort of spy versus spy here, if it's just some some strategic psychological warfare on Floyd's part, if he's trying to plant seeds that I'm going to come after you when he's really just going to run, duck and run, duck and run, which is all he's ever done his whole career. Last knockout, I point out, 1999. Don't, don't worry about all that. Yeah. When so, was his last loss? He never lost. Oh. And I'm not sure who he ever fought in their prime. You know, somebody who was really dangerous. I thought it was going to be Manny Pacquiao, but of course he had torn his rotator cuff three weeks before that fight. So beat De La Hoya. Yeah. He that was a shell of De La Hoya. Come on. That was the end to him. Shane Mosley. <sighs> Zab old, how, how old was Shane at that Chop, point? Chop like Corley. 30, wasn't he 36? John Bay Mitchell. Oh, Arturo Gotti. Oh, please. They were all at the end of the line. He caught them on the way down. What, why would you okay, want Floyd to be, fine. 60? That's fine. I got it. So now, Connor is catching Floyd on the way down at 40, which brings me to this weird story that Floyd told about how Connor so got under his skin. Remember, this is Floyd Mayweather. This is a guy who's 49 and 0. This is the greatest defensive fighter ever who's been around for a long, long time. And you let some little MMA guy from Ireland get that deep under your skin by calling you the B word that you felt like that you had to go confront him with four or five of your girls and your daughter. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a weird mix. Four or five of your girls. You traveled four or five of your girls and your daughter. Yeah. And you felt the need to go prove to, hey, little dude, you needed to go prove to him your I guess your heterosexuality and your virility, because he called you the B word, among other things. And so you have to go prove to him you got four or five girls with you? Wow. No. Boy, no. that's bold, Floyd. No. Skip, stop. Huh? Well, that's you what he was this, doing. You, you I, no, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what that comes off as. Yeah, he had, he had a few of them things with him, and yeah. he, he, went, he didn't even take his team. Now, I've seen Floyd out. I've never hey, seen... Hey, but what was he trying to prove to Connor? What was he... Tr he's trying to show him... I'm heterosexual. Look at all my women. No, Look, I got a no, daughter. No, no. He was right? he he's trying to let him know. I've never seen Floyd out in public when he didn't have at least four of those dudes, like six, five, three hundred pounds with him. And so he had them fangs with him and his daughter to let you know I'm not scared. But you know, my grandfather used to say, Boy, you're an awful poor cowboy if you ain't got but one horse to ride. I don't know what he meant by that, Joy, but that's what he told me. But anyway. 
Floyd had four of them things with him and his daughter, showed up at Connor to let Connor know, I ain't got no team with me, bruh. Ain't no punk in me. I'm here with these girls and my daughter. So whatever you want to do, we can do it if we got to do that. Mm. Now, I want to save it for August 26th. But here's the thing, Skip. He's selling the fight. You know he's selling the fight. No, Skip. no, no not, on the, not with this confrontation. No, 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 okay. no. no. The right. confrontation was real. See, the thing is, Skip, I think Floyd, look, for me, I mean, saying that you might slept with my girlfriend or my wife, that's one thing. But when you start getting getting racially motivated, dance, you know, dance right. boy or calling me a monkey, mm -hmm. now that's a different level. Didn't call him a monkey, but called in general. Right. Yes. So now we yes. now we're on a different level. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, I know Skip, you do what you do. That's why it's so hard for people to break tendencies and habits. Because when you've done something for such a long time, it's ingrained in you. And even though you might get out of that when you feel comfortable, the moment you get in a stressful situation, you'll always revert back to what you know because it's muscle memory. What Floyd knows is that if he gets hurt, which he's never been, he's going to get in that defensive stance. Skip, why would I risk 49-0 and 0 to try to appease Skip Bayless? Because that's what Skip wants. See, Skip wants to come on Monday and say, I told you. That's what Skip wants. Skip, I boxed a little I, bit. I just, I, I just like to see him get knocked on his tail. I know, but it ain't gonna happen. Hmm. And talking to fighters, Holyfield, Mark Breland, talk to Lennox Lewis a little bit. He says, in order to knock, they say, in order to knock someone out, you have to open yourself up. Sure. Because when you're getting ready to throw, you, unless you're an octopus and can put gloves up to your face and throw at the same time, you only have two hands. Okay, that's the point I just made yes. about Floyd yes. trying to go high risk, high reward right. to knock him out inside four rounds. But that's not Floyd's game. Floyd is, Floyd is, is a counterpuncher. He lets you throw, he sends something back at you. Okay. And normally it's multiples. Now, he doesn't send as many back as he once did. Normally it's like one, two. So he's looking to pick you off. Skip, in order for Floyd to get out of his comfort zone, you're asking him to do something that he has not done in his professional career. I don't believe, I do not believe it. Now, hey, I guess a desperate man will do a lot of, do a lot of things that we don't think he would normally do. But I don't believe Floyd will be in desperation because I don't believe that Conor McGregor can drag him out to deep waters, especially in a boxing ring. And that's what I know Floyd can do to him. Floyd has gone 12 rounds. Conor McGregor has never gone 12 rounds. Conor McGregor has never been against, in a boxing match for any extended length of time. He went 12 time. against Pauly, according to Pauly oh, Malinaji. So are you, hold on, wait just a mm -hmm. second, Skip. Yes, are you, sir. Are you saying Pauly Malinaji and, and, and Floyd Mayweather name in the same breath? I'm saying 12 rounds is 12 rounds with Joe Cortez trying to referee it, trying to keep, the, 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 keep it in bounds. And it was two guys who do not like each other because Connor brought in the one sparring partner who does not like Connor McGregor. So there was bad blood from the start. Paulie didn't like the circumstance. He didn't like that an audience had been summoned to witness this. And it went 12 hellacious rounds, according to both men. Skip, I can't Okay, well, don't, don't tell me he's never gone twice. He just did it Skip. three weeks before Skip. the fight. I can't believe you that you would fix your mouth, part your lips, and let come out Pauly Malinaji and Floyd Mayweather in a sparring Pauly session. Pauly Malinaji is a two-weight world champion. A five-time, a okay. five-division. I, I got it, but you just said undefeated. he's never gone 12 rounds. Skip. He just did. So hold on. Against so, a real hold, live boxer who hates his guts. I'm just, so I just want to make sure, just for, just for my clarification, so you're basically saying practice and game is the same thing. No, I'm not. You just said he's never gone 12 rounds. That's about as close as you can get. I think it was a real 12-round no, fight. No, And I, I underlined fight. Skip. They were fighting. Because here's the thing, Skip. When you practice, practice is one thing. But when you get into that arena and that adrenaline get going, and you hear those fans applauding you. That's something, to, it takes you to a place that you don't, you can't get to in practice. Now me, you start talking crazy to me, I got to put you on tape, let coaches mm -hmm. know they might need to get rid of you because you can't do nothing with me in practice. Okay. That's just and, me. And I'm going to try to explain to you. I did go to the second Nate Diaz, Conor McGregor fight, and I was in the second row, and again, those are five-minute rounds, three of them, and it seemed like it went forever yeah. because they are engaging. They are connecting with basically bare knuckles, and it was one of the great 
tests of will, tests of will I've ever witnessed live. And I saw Connor have on his track shoes at the end of round five running because he didn't want Nate, uh, round, yeah, he didn't want yeah. Nate Diaz to get his hands on him. Why was he running, Skip? Because Nate Diaz is so much bigger than him that he was able in the first fight to get him on the ground. Ooh. He probably outweighed him by 40 pounds, which brings me back to the irony of this confrontation that Floyd got so stung by Connor referring to him again and again as you're too little. Little head, little torso, little legs. He really drove in the little legs. Mm -hmm. Don't worry yelling about to his father, hey, Pops, he's too little. He's too little. So Floyd had to turn it around on Connor, who is much bigger than Floyd, and say, hey, little dude, it doesn't work, Floyd. It doesn't work. It's not no. going to put him in his no. place. No, what, what happened was if Floyd rolled up, pulled up on him, we didn't have his bodyguard because mm. you remember when when Floyd the Decepticons surrounded him in Brooklyn and you're like what's going on Th Floyd? that was about you... to happen it was either that night or the next uh, it was probably that night it so, had to be so Floyd yeah. pulled yeah. up on him without them to oh. let him know oh oh boy I'll bet Connor was scared and by the way I'm not buying Floyd's interpretation of what Connor said he ain't say nothing I I'll bet he said a whole lot right back that. in Floyd but here's the thing Skip there are no in professional sports. There are no moral victories. Either you win or you mm -hmm. lose. Whether it goes twelve rounds or however the fight ends, they're going to be a winner and they're okay. going to be a loser. That's yeah. not what Mayweather said. And, and once the fight skip, Floyd is trying to sell this. Once, hey, put it like this here. Once you press yes to eighty nine ninety nine or ninety nine ninety nine, guess what, Skip? You can flip the channel. You can do whatever you want to. Pay per view not giving you that money back. So he's just trying to. He, he got you. <clears throat> he got Skip Bayless. Mm. But see, the thing is with me, I already know what's going to happen. Mm. I just want to see him just pick him apart. Mm. I don't want him to knock him out inside mm. of five rounds because that's a coward's way out. Oh, I want him to punish him. Way out. I don't want him to go to sleep on the oh, job. Oh, Lord have mercy. Skip, if, if you I go, can't wait for if you go to If you go to a job and you go to you work in eight hours, you go to sleep in five hours, you cheating. You're sleeping on the job. Uh-uh. Get him all 12, Floyd. All 12. Lump him up. No mercy. Thanks for listening to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. We'll catch you again same time Monday morning at 9.30 Eastern. Have a great weekend. Fox Sports. One of one.